Esta mañana tenemos eh, como invitado al doctor Keith Barton. Es oftalmólogo, staff y especialista en glaucoma en el Mursfield Eye Hospital. Es lector honorario en el UCL Institute of Ophthalmology. También co-chair del Ophthalmology Future Forums. Editor y jefe de la revista British Journal of Ophthalmology. Y tiene mucho interés en el manejo quirúrgico de glaucoma, especialmente en dispositivos quirúrgicos y glaucoma secundarios, específicamente glaucoma ueítico, que es eh, súper interesante. Él fue el único doctor fuera de Norteamérica en participar en algunos estudios como el tubo versus trave, que todo el mundo lo conoce como TVT study, y también eh, fue co share del estudio eh, muy interesante también de Ahmed versus Berwell. Es miembro del comité en varios estudios también como el Treatment Advanced Glaucoma, Lasers in Glaucoma y Ocular Hypertension. Le gusta mucho enseñar. Él ha hecho una página web llamada mix.org donde da mucha información a los pacientes y médicos que bueno, quieren aprender sobre estas nuevas técnicas. Ha trabajado también en forma caritativa en el oeste de África, en un lugar que se llama Ghana. Toma regularmente también parte en eventos deportivos para recaudar eh, dinero. Eh, hubo un tiempo en que recaudó mucho dinero, casi como 74 mil euros para la Asociación Internacional de Glaucoma, haciendo ciclismo. Y esta, este evento fue hacer ciclismo desde Londres a París en 24 horas en tres años consecutivos. Bueno, fuera de glaucoma también ha hecho un eh, fellowship en córnea y external disease en el Vascon Palmer. O sea, es súper completo. Keith, uh, thank you very much for participating in these uh, webinars here in Lima. Uh, thank you and you are welcome. Well, thank you very much, Juan Carlos. Thanks for the very kind invitation. It's a very strange time. Um, and I, yes. it, it, it's very sad because I don't get to experience the fantastic restaurants of Lima this time, but which uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Lima has the best restaurants in the world and uh, you, you missed that on the web. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we're all in, in a strange position here. I'm sitting here in the office. I actually came into the office and I've got my N95 supply of masks that my friend sent me from China. Uh, we're all protected, but... Uh, but none of us are doing anything except uh, watching TV these days. So this is a, yes. an, an unusual opportunity. Um, I've got to talk, uh, we, we discussed, uh, you, I, I've spoken several times in Lima and, uh, and uh, the, the Peruvian Ophthalmological Society are probably sick of hearing me talk about tubes. Um, I know that you don't have the Zen implant or, or the in-focus microshunt in, in Peru at the moment, but uh, the, these things are obviously coming, and this is uh, a great um, uh, improvement in our portfolio of uh, glaucoma surgery. This is the Zen, which I'm sure you've seen um, pictures of and presentations of, which is an ab internal um, external drainage device. So, so, it, so it's ab internal injection uh, to the subconjunctival space. And this is the, a very, very um, uh, diagrammatic version of how it's injected, which isn't entirely uh, the same as how it is in real life, but it gives you an idea. The other type of uh, Subconjunctival MIGS device devices, the in-focus microshunt, what I call the pressor flow by Santan. I have to point out if you're a, let me say, if you're a millennial glaucoma surgeon who likes to do eye stents and SLT and get scared uh, when you see blood and don't like to suture, then forget about these. These, these are for people who do trabeculectomies, uh, for people with glaucoma practices that are used to the workflow. They're not for cataract surgeons alone because they need post-operative management. It's not just the operation. So there, there's more to it than just, um, that, than just the operation. But uh, he, this point, I'll, I'll concentrate the operation. This is a, 
uh, the, the Preser flow and uh, micro shunt implantation, which is a little bit different from the Zen in its ab externo, which makes it a, a bigger operation, but it has certain advantages as well. And it's a fine polymer tube that drains to the uh, external subconjunctival space. And um, the difference between this and the Zen is that you need to do a peritomy just like a, a trabeculectomy. And even though it's a very small device, it's quite useful to do quite a large peritomy. Um, the, uh, my preference is to put them in slightly temporal. While we always do trabeculectomies at 12 o'clock, this device produces a more posterior bleb, so you can get away with putting them temporally or nasally, and temporal causes less dysesthesia in general. And mitomycin is still essential. I use 0.4 to 0.5 milligrams per mil on sponges for three minutes. Um, be before washing everything away. And uh, I, the, the recommended technique is with sponges rather than injection, and that does tend to give more diffuse blebs than you get with injection. After some light cautery, you, you make a mark three millimeters behind the limbus and the marker comes with in the packet like that. And you really want to be three millimeters, I guess, behind the transition zone. Um, so that, and then you use a, a partial thickness scleral tunnel using a one millimeter split uh, keratome that it comes in the packet with the device as well. And, and as a rough estimate, you go up to the hilt of the knife, but basically you want the point, the tip to be at the transition zone between cornea and sclera. And then a 25 gauge needle is, in, is used to enter the anterior chamber. This has to be bent in order to avoid the brow quite often. If you've got a, a patient with a prominent eyebrow, yeah, you, you won't get the angle right. And it, it's important to get the angle right or it can end up in the cornea or in the iris. And you shimmy it up the tunnel and then tilt it forward to the center of the eye, um, just anterior to the plane of the iris. Hopefully avoiding cornea, but also avoiding being right in the iris. It has to be a clean stab. You cannot, uh, if you distort the tissues on the way in, then the tube will follow the line of the tissues, not the line of the, of the needle. So you've got to um, remember that uh, the, uh, you've got to go in with no distortion. But otherwise, it's a fairly simple technique. And you can see that although it starts off as a trabeculectomy, it's uh, the actual um, implantation technique it is very uh, the implantation looks like the express in the beginning, right? It is, yeah. It, it, has, of, a yeah. Of, it has a couple of advantages over the express. You know, it's a more posterior uh, tunnel. Mm -hmm. It's uh, because it's a flexible tube. It's less likely to stimulate encapsulation, erosion, and so forth, and it produces a very posterior drainage bleb. If you don't get flow as soon as you put it in, you it won't lower the IOP. So you've got to get it to flow. And very and this is a hydrophobic tube. So it doesn't flow automatically a lot of the time. Sometimes you have to pump up the anterior chamber. Uh, you can do a paracentesis or even just inflate via the tunnel. Um, and sometimes that's enough. Uh, if, if the eye is soft, it won't flow. Um, other times just depress gently on the eye. Uh, if it doesn't flow with uh, inflation or depression, or pressing on the eye, you can use a cannula. And that's a special thin-walled cannula that, that is available, but you don't need to have that special cannula um, to get flow. I often, when it's not available, I use the standard 21-gauge uh, cannula that's, that the nurses have on the operating trolley. And, uh, but you do need to um, inflate quite hard uh, because the tube is a resistor, it, you, you're not going to inflate the anterior chamber very hard, but you'll inflate the tube quite hard, and that does um, usually get it to work. Now, it's a, a very, very easy for these things to get caught in tenons. So when you, you've got to close the conjunctiva, 
we're going to try and bring the tenons up either to the limbus or just behind the limbus. If the tenons is very loose, you can bring it right up to the limbus with a conjunctiva. If it's a little bit tight, then uh, stitch it down a little further back and separately from the conjunctiva. But either way, you, you, you need to ensure that the, the tenons is not catching and obstructing or bl blocking or bending the tube. Um, and, and then that's basically it. Uh, it was eight days after surgery, the bleb's still a bit red and diffuse, but the pressure's good. Usually the pressures are in single figures in, in the first uh, week or two. It's extremely rare to actually get significant hypotony. We have seen it, but it's extremely rare. Um, it's not uncommon to get pressures of four or five that don't require intervention, but it's, it's rare to get one where you actually need to intervene. And you can see these blebs are very posterior, which is, uh, which is attractive. Um, Moving on, the Zen obviously has been around a few more years, and we've we had experience with the Zen back to 2012, when the first uh, went with the, the Zen 63, which is the one that preceded the current Zen. Again, it, it has some uh, some similarities to Microshunt and, and some differences. It's um, a natural product. It's porcine gelatin, which is cross-linked. It's a smaller tube. It's only 45 microns in internal diameter rather than 70. And it's only six millimeters long rather than eight. So it doesn't go quite as pos far posteriorly. Um, and it, but again, it produces a bleb. The blebs tend to be more limbal simply because the tube's shorter. It's harder to get a more posterior bleb. And the Zen is probably the first mixed type procedure that's capable of producing pressures in the same uh, uh, manner as a trabeculectomy, but but it, it doesn't do this in everyone. You've got to um, select your cases very carefully. You've got to um, just going to move that slightly. You've got to select your cases very carefully, and you need to, uh, to adapt certain techniques and post-operative maneuvers to make it work. And the in-focus microshunt, when you put it in, if you get it to work. There isn't really much to do afterwards. Um, the blebs are not that easy to needle um, because it's under tenons, you can't see it so easily. Um, whereas the Zen, uh, there's more, more work involved afterwards. The Zen, like the microshunt, requires mitomycin, but because it's ab internal, you have to inject the mitomycin. And you have to be careful because it's very easy to end up in the mitomycin bleb at the limbus, uh, as in here. And you do have to really massage it away uh, to ensure that it's. Uh, it's not uh, completely limbal. But there are certain issues, there's case selection, mitomycin application, positioning, checking the function, uh, and manipulating it afterwards to get it right. In terms of case selection, I find very early on that they seem to work better in the low scarring ethnicities, especially white people. And you, like everything, it, this is a generalization, but they don't tend to work as well in blacks or Indians, just as trabeculectomies don't. They work much better in patients with virgin conjunctiva, the short-term exposure to medical therapy only. Your patient who's been on uh, a lot of benzalkonium containing medication for many years with conjunctival inflammation, who wouldn't do so well with a trabeculectomy, will do even less well with a Zen, or an in-focus for that matter, probably. So the, the virgin conjunctiva with short-term exposure to medical therapy works better. Um, and my experience, it tend to work better in younger people, but the, the, the data doesn't seem to show that. The mitomycin has to be injected. And if you're not careful, you can end up with a bleb like this. Um, th this is pretty dramatic and it, that, that's unusual, but it, it's just a warning. Um, it, because it's injected, um, I showed this a moment ago, you've got to try and uh, push it away from the limbus more posteriorly. Other, otherwise, you have the mitomycin collected at the limbus. And uh, we tend to use 0.1 milligram per mil of, uh, 0.1 mil of 0.2 milligrams per mil, very small amount of mitomycin, because obviously if you go higher, you end up with more limbal uh, bleds. So that's just spreading the mitomycin out, but, but not actually pushing it further back. Um, and, and you really want to uh, brush it further back. Uh, to, to get it, uh, as in this case, 
you can see when you first inject it, it's hard to stop it coming up to limbus. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, but but you can you can use um, you you can make it more diffuse using a, a sponge or a any kind of blunt instrument, and then push it away back to the limbus so that you don't end up with the dysesthetic blebs. Uh, just going back to that pr previous one, there, the, 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 the tech, there's a little bit more of the technique on this. Um, after you, you, you see here, I, I spread it out laterally, but I didn't really push it away. And this is one of the very early cases where we wouldn't really, uh, wouldn't really have that much experience with it and didn't. Uh, uh, and to be quite honest, many of the blebs to start with were great. It's just with time and doing hundreds of cases, started getting more avascular ones and then realized the importance of spreading it further and further back. And that's why I don't use higher doses of mito with the Zen, whereas I do higher, use higher doses with the um, Infocus. You got to, like the Infocus, you mark three millimeters from the limbus, but with the conjunctiva closed. I've been using a 20 gauge MVR blade. The, the Zen injector is a little wider than 20 gauge, so I tend to widen the, the, the the site. I don't use a phaco incision um, because it's more likely to leak. If you used Helon GV, um, you got to remove the, the pin. Check that there's a Zen inside. Very, very rarely there isn't. Um, and you can tell this is, a, this is a 2015 video I made some time ago. And the, the technique has evolved since then. And um, I show this part of it really because you it's you could be careful not to catch the injector on the speculum i start i took to using the uh, uh, because we didn't have an instrument that held the eye very firmly uh steadily and we were doing these in, in fake guys i took to using an irish repositor or cyclodialysis spatula right across the eye through two um uh, paracentesis um, which gives a little bit more torsional control than uh, just using a mushroom or the vera hook. And the mushroom and the vera hook, of course, are very adequate, but you want to, we, we were putting these initially nasally, which is not good. And if you want to get them up at 12 o'clock under the eyelids, so the, so the bleb is covered, uh, you need to have good control uh, of uh, the Zen because, or of the injector, because when you go up under the eyelid and you push the Zen uh, injector, it tends to disappear and you can't see what you're doing. So the Irish repository gave a bit more control and it's a useful tip for beginners, although it's not the standard technique. Then you inject, and I always inject subconjunctivally, not under tenons. And I, I've been adamant about this from the start because although, uh, the, although the company varied about on their advice about whether to go subtenons or not, if you go under tenons, you can't see where it is and you don't know if it's occluded or not. You go right up to conjunctiva, you can see if it's free or not. And it's pretty uncommon to go, to go through the conjunctiva. You've got to see if there's a bleb. If there's no bleb on the table, then you won't have a bleb afterwards. And, uh, and uh. there are, uh, but postoperatively, it does tend to cause diffuse blebs, although they're closer to the limbus and tend to be a little more avascular than the, the in focus ones. As I mentioned, you've got Keep. to brush the mitomycin back. Sorry, yeah. Keep. Yeah, one question there. I, I saw that uh, when you implant the device, you don't use like a gonioscopic lens. No, it's very tricky to use gonio at the same time as putting in a Zen. And uh, what, uh, for instance, Ike Ahmed does is he lines it up with the gonio and puts the uh, puts the um, the injector in place against the trabecular mesh where it takes the gonio off and then injects. The trouble is you need three uh -huh. hands to use gonio because you have to have a second instrument. It's a, th this is not like an eye stent, um, which is a very, very um, gentle technique. This is a physical technique. Um, you have to push the injector into sclera and you need counter traction with some sort of second instrument. You can't do it without. So if you've got, a, if you've got one hand on the injector and the other hand on the second instrument, you, you you've got no hand for the gonio lens. The, if you are using a gonio lens, the Ahmed gonio lens is the one to use. It gives the best view. But, but even the people who do use the gonio lens take it off before they actually inject. You can't inject mm -hmm. with it on at the same time unless you've got three hands. <laughs> okay. Or a very, very well-coordinated fellow. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And other question is, in what moment uh, you put the mitomycin? One week before the procedure or in the moment that That's you a very plan good the device? Question. We, initially, we started doing it in the ward before the patient came around. So they have you know, 10 or 15 minutes for it to spread out. Um, the trouble is, if you want to get it very superiorly, you need to be able to pull the eye down and and do all these manipulations. So you need to be doing it intra at the time of surgery to be able to do that, unless you take the patient to some sort of minor OR and do it in advance and then take them back to the OR later. So we tend to do it in the operating theater at the same time as the surgery. Ah, oh, perfect, perfect. So uh, injecting up onto the upper lid is not always achievable, but ideal. Um, and why is this important? As I mentioned, the blebs can be limbal. You can also get very dysesthetic blebs with, with, with Zens. And that's, I've, I've, I've only, I think I've only seen one dysesthesia within focus. With Zens, you can get very dysesthetic blebs because they're close to the limbus and they can extend nasally. Because you're injecting it from an infrotemporal position, the bleb, <coughs> the Zen itself, can easily end up very, very nasal. You want to try and get it onto the eyelid and uh, getting it up to 12 o'clock is tricky. You want to aim to exit the sclera three millimeters behind the limbus. If you go more anterior, it can be very corneal. If you go more posterior, it can end up super choroidal. And if, it go, if you go posterior and it ends up super choroidal, there, there's nothing wrong with that, except you end up with a very short zen in the anterior chamber and a very short zen in the suprachoroidal space, or sorry, in the subconjunctival space because the, the, the uh, scleral suprachoroidal path is longer, or you can end up with a stuck in the iris. So you really wanna be aiming your injector to come out within three millimeters of the limbus, not more. And not, not a lot short, but not more than that, um, because you end up with a very long path and a very deep injection, and you can end up, um, uh, it, it, this one actually paradoxically is longer, but in general, if you go deeper, it ends up shorter. So this one's longer, which means there's probably very, very little in the subconjunctival space. Uh, this one, on the other hand, is very corneal. Now, we don't have endothelial cell counts, and the Zen is small, and it's also um, at collagen, so it probably doesn't do any harm to corneal endothelium, but we don't know that. Um, and he, he, here's another one that end up very corneal. So you, you've got it. So the, the, these were uh, videos were all taken very early on with, during the learning curve when we. Um, we're trying to figure out how to get these things in the, in the right place. And th this one was one that was uh, actually ended up in the cornea itself. So you can end up with malposition zens. Even with the best of, even with the best of times, it, it is tricky to ensure the same length at choroidal, or sorry, the same length subconjunctival and the same length in the anterior chamber. And to some extent that is determined by the, the, the stiffness of the subconjunct and resistance of the subconjunctival tissues and also the stiffness of the Zen. If the Zen's dry when it goes into subconjunctival space, it can sometimes uh, ping back into the anterior chamber. On the other hand, if the Zen's very wet when it gets in the subconjunctival space, it doesn't tend to come back and you can end up very short in the subconjunct in the anterior chamber. So even the dryness of it can matter. And, and in general, if you're putting it in through a, uh, an anterior chamber that has helon GV, it doesn't wet, wet very much. So it can be quite dry and, uh, and recoil into the anterior chamber. Uh, so if you find it's doing that, then that, that's sometimes the reason. But I do aim to go subconjunctival, get it right up to your tenting the conjunctiva because if you clear of tenons, then at least you can see where it is. And you can see this one, you can see this one's coming out um, straight. It's not wrapping itself up in, in a pigtail. And then when you get to that point, uh, you really need a visible bleb. If there's no bleb on the table, then you're stuck. Um, and you really gotta think 
you know, where is it? Can you see the end of it externally? Can you see the end of it internally? The first thing to do is, is remove the viscoelastic. I mean, is this blood? Well, it looks like there's blood there as well, but sometimes it can be difficult to tell. Um, but you really, really need to remove all of the viscoelastic. And then, because remember, these very tiny tubes can actually get blocked with viscoelastic. The Zen, eh, unlike the InFocus, it also can um, have peritubular flow because the, the injector of the Zen is bigger than the Zen itself. So you can get drainage around the outside of the Zen and get a bleb from that, but uh, which we cannot do with the InFocus. And with the InFocus, you don't want any viscoelastic in the anterior chamber at the end of, uh, and I don't use any. Whereas with the Zen, we, you have to use viscoelastic, but you do have to remove it. This is the Ahmed Gonio lens, which is really um, uh, uh, the best Gonio lens for looking uh, for these things. But if you're not getting a blab, you look and see, well, that, that one's in the anterior chamber. Occasionally, occasionally you might see a big blood clot and it might simply be um, occluded with blood. And then if you suck out the blood, maybe you'll get a blab at that point. Um, but certainly remove the viscoelastic. If you don't get a blab, look for it in the anterior chamber. Um, if it's like this pigtailed externally. Um, many people recommend needling. I'm, I'm not a big fan of needling. I tend to try and unwrap it just, and you can do this gently with forceps. It, it, can, be, it, 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 can, be quite a, it can be quite a slow uh, procedure. Um, and uh, you've got to have some patience, but uh, th this one, uh, and just slowly, slowly unwrapping. Um, and this is speeded up just to, to give you an idea, mm -hmm. but you can slowly sort of push it out of the tenons and get it straightened up. And hopefully at that point, uh, hopefully at that point, get some sort of a bleb afterwards. Again, if you're not getting a bleb and you're not happy that it's free, then you've got to think why, because what you don't want to do is find the pressure's 30 the next day and it's not working. Uh, so you got to do something on the table if it doesn't work. Afterwards, um, again, these are tiny tubes and they can block easily. And this uh, was a patient who had a good pressure on day one, but a few days later, four or five days later, the pressure is high. Now, um, nobody scars up in four or five days, so the pressure is high after four or five days. It's, sometimes it's just got stuck in tenons or maybe occluded in the anterior chamber. And uh, this is just uh, maneuvering with a needle or with forceps, just trying to free it. And very, very occasionally, you can get the pressure down again, simply by manipulating it and getting any tenons out of it. If that doesn't work, then you've got to needle it. Now, the mean needling rate with Zens is much higher than with InFocus. It's about 32% in the Apex study. And you can see here the, um, the needling range from zero to 71%. Um, and some people do it in the slip lamp, some people do it in the operating theater. Now, needling Zens is, is, is interesting. Now, this is a, a Zen that's clearly patent because there's a big bleb, and I think the bleb's just encapsulated. And in this situation, you can just puncture it by multiple uh, uh, needle punctures of the cyst. <laughs> that one's easy. And the question is, will it stay or will it scar up again later? And you might inject five or a year or so uh, to try and stop it scarring up again. And with luck, you get a diffuse bleb, but there is further risk of encapsulation, we all know. Uh, you need to use a lot of anesthetic, the patient might disappear like here. Um, this is doing slit lamp zens, it can be quite painful. You've got a sweep underneath the Zen and away from it, and you'll sweep on top of it and away from it. Unfortunately, of course, even using um, adrenaline or epinephrine or iopidine, you, you can get bleeding. It, it's very hard to avoid. So, so what is your bleep needling percentage? It's also like 30% or less I than like that. Needling. I, I, I needle very few of them for this reason. I find it frustrating and you, you can see why. I'm, and this one here is very scarred down. And yes, you can get something to happen from needling it, but you end up with a lot of blood. Um, it's hard work. 
you don't get an immediate yes. result. You've got to send, you know, the, you need a latrab and the pressure goes down immediately. You need a zen. It, it takes a while to know if it's even worked. Even successful needlings differ from trabs in that you, it can take 20 minutes, half an hour to know if it's done anything. So you've got to send the patient away, check the pressure. Uh, and the, it's not always obvious straight away if there's a bleb because these are very tiny devices. And occasionally you can run into problems. This, this one is one where I needled it and it slid into the anterior chamber. Okay. So you can traumatize the Zen by needling it. You can, uh, as in this case, push in the anterior chamber or this case where it got sliced up into uh, two or three pieces. This was a guy who had multiple needlings and it looks like uh, all we did was salami, uh, turn the Zen into <laughs> salami. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm, I don't like needling particularly for that reason. I find open uh, revision much more satisfying because you can see what you're doing. You can see what you're doing. You can see what it's, where the Zen is. You can see if it's working. And if it's not working, you can replace it. It's just much, from a surgeon's point of view, open revision is much more satisfying than needling. Did you have any like uh, conch erosion? erosion? With yeah, this we device? Had, uh, yeah, we had three um, out of about 150. Surprisingly, I didn't wow. think they would erode, but, but we did have some. Um, and then you, I, I just remove them in the slit lamp. So in, in terms of revising, going back to the, op going back to the operating theater, I um, you know, put in a traction suture. Uh, I opened the conjunctiva at the limbus, try and keep it away from the Zen. Um, I, my very first two uh, Zen revisions, so two or three, I decided to revise by opening up right over the Zen and then trying to dissect the sclera. Uh, that, 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 that was a big mistake um, because when I, if you open up right over the Zen and then try and suture later, they just leak. And the first two I did, they just leaked and leaked. And I revised them again, they leaked again. Um, so I open away from the Zen. And it's also um, worth opening at, oh, wide of the Zen as well as at the limbus so that you can get a decent plane of dissection. Um, and again, it's just like, you know, doing a trabeculectomy and and you want to try, I try usually when I'm doing this, I, as I say, I start, I do quite a big peritomy. I start away from it so that I can get a decent tissue plane and I can get under con between conjunctiva and tenons without actually uh, uh, opening the Zen to start with. And I, I want it like this to start with, still encapsulated, because then I can put on mitomycin. I don't like to use mitomycin whenever the Zen's free and draining because um, then you might get some mitomycin inside the eye. Sometimes it's unavoidable though. Here, you, you know, I can see that this very scarred down, even with the wide peritomy, it's very scarred down and just opening the conjunctiva is exposing the Zen straight away. And then if you put on mitomycin, you just got to be careful to avoid getting it uh, too close to the Zen. And I put in four corneal shields with about point four, much more mitomycin than I used to start with, 0.4 to 0.5 for three minutes, pushing it away from the limbus. Uh, have you ever have to explant the sin and make the conversion to a trap? Uh, yeah, I've had ones, oops, something's happened here. I mean, I've got a bit PowerPoint uh, constipation. Um, I have, only if, basically if a Zen fails and then a revision fails, then, then I wouldn't do any more with a Zen. You know, if, if I, um, I, I certainly have done traps. I try, I usually didn't have explant the Zen. In retrospect, given the side pass issue with the endothelium, if I'm revising an in focus, I'm putting in a trap, doing a trap or a tube, I will remove the in-focus because I don't think we should be leaving a piece of plastic uh, again, anywhere near the endothelium. 
Zen's college, and I don't know that it's such a big deal. It's also smaller. So, so I have left it behind, but it's not unreasonable to remove it as well, obviously. Okay. So then uh, occasionally, and this is another benefit of open revision. Now, when you're needling, you can't see this. So this is a Zen, obviously, that's worked, but it's got clogged up with pigments from iris. So it's probably rubbing against the iris and just blocked. And by opening open sky, you can see that, which you can't see um, normally. If you get one that's patent internally in the anterior chamber, and it's patent externally, but it's not draining, what do you do? Well, you can flush it just like the, um, like you can with the uh, um, in focus. And usually you can get it to drain again. If you don't get it, if you flush and it doesn't drain, like that one, one that was full of pigment, I would just replace because there's too much stuff stuck in it and I think it would be a waste of time uh, uh, flushing it. Uh, here, I think, possibly the same one. Um, so this is ab external implantation. So you've got it Zen, it's clearly not working, and you flushed it, it's still not working. So you can inject another one. Now you've got to be very careful, just like ab internal, when you inject them ab external, <coughs> you've got to be careful not to flick on the way out, because if you get a big flick on the way out, the Zen uh, pings across the, the room and doesn't stay in the eye. Where do you see this? So this comes out, I, and you can see I've already not lined up properly in a little up. Yep. When you get a flick like that, where's the Zen? No Zen. It's gone. It's hit the nurse or it's hit the wall or something. Um, now, <laughs> this is important. A number of the American colleagues um, have de decided very wisely, I think, that the ab internal, while ideal, is too hit and miss. Um, ab external gives you good visible function and positioning. So they're doing primary ab external injections and you're, I'm sure you've seen these presentations and there is something to be said for it. With a primary ab external injection, you don't need to do a big peritomy like this, but you can uh, do a smaller one. You can put mitomycin in on sponges. You can put it further back. You can position the Zen under tenons perfectly. So there is something to be said for ab external injection. Though I tend to do it just in these situations, and this is the same one except uh, uh, with a little bit less of a flick this time. And uh, it's still flicked, but you can see the Zen's in position and you can see the flow. And if you wait just a second, I think, uh, yeah. And when you hear about um, peritubular flow, this, this is what we're talking about. You can see there's some flow coming out of the Zen, but there's an awful lot coming out around the base of it. And that's because the injector is a little bit bigger than the Zen. So this is why on day one, you can get quite a lot of hypotony with a Zen, but not with an in-focus. It doesn't have the, uh, the, the, the in-focus tube fits perfectly in the tunnel. The Zen is, is too leaky around the base. And it, it, why it's not a... Sometimes we have to inject viscoelastic again the next day. We had about it. 23% hypotony rate. Usually nothing too serious, but we were injecting viscoelastic with Zens, which we're not having to do with in focus. If you're not sure where it's coming from, you can use fluorescein, you can use vision blue. You can put vision blue in the outside, put it in the inside. But you can see that here in this case, um, which was a, another Zen replacement, the, the, yes. the leakage is actually from the previous entry site, not, not the new one. So the, new, so the new one needs to be flushed because it's not actually draining. Uh, and all of that vision blue is coming out from where I removed the previous one. So I'm just injecting here. In fact, I think the remains that, I think this is the one that was sliced and the previous one is still there, still draining. Um, but I put in another one which doesn't seem to be draining. Uh, if you use vision blue, you do get blue Zens the next day, which is quite uh, photogenic. Uh, they returned to the normal color after about two weeks, which was uh, quite funny. Afterwards, so in your experience, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. So in, in your experience, uh, now what approach do you prefer? Like AB external or AB, AB internal? Yeah, I, I've been doing mainly in focus recently, uh, mainly revising the Zams, um, but 
I, I'd be very tempted. I mean, I, I, I like the cleanness and the simplicity of Ab Interno, but I have to say I'm much more impressed with the, the certainty of what I've achieved with Ab External. You know, Ab External is more messy because you've got to open up, but you know where it is and you know if it's working. Um, so going uh, ahead, I prefer Ab External. Although I believe the company is making a smaller injector and perhaps possibly a longer Zen uh, that may make Ab Internal more and more tempting again. So mm -hmm. I've mixed things at the minute. Okay. And as I say, you've got to close the conjunctiva again, just like with the in focus, you, you want to close it and draw the tenons up over the Zen so you're not occluding it. These are tiny tubes, as I mentioned, it's very easy to block them. So there, there are, um, there are uh, despite the challenges of bleb management, Zen is the first mixed procedure that produces IOP lowering anyway, like a trabeculectomy in select, selected cases. And there are a few simple tips that enhance success. Um, I, I appreciate uh, this is all a bit theoretical if you don't have it available, but I would think that you will have it available fairly soon. I mean, these things are, are moving around the world. I'm happy to answer any questions. For the cataract surgeon, one point. Um, I have been doing Zens in combination with cataract surgery. We do not do in focus in combination with cataract surgery. Like, uh, like combined phaco trap, in focus in combination with cataract surgery seems to be less effective than, uh, than in focus alone. So we tend to do the in focus and do the cataract six months later. That, I don't know if that's true of the Zen or not. We have been doing Zens combined and case selection is critical. Anyway, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Keith. So we will thank you very much for the, your participation and we will start with the questions. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. So yes, we were talking about the approach. So about AV internal and AV external. Uh, yeah. So there is a question here. What do you prefer? In focus or Zen? At the minute, in focus is uh, it is easier because it's less post-operative care, uh, um, even though it's a, a bigger operation. Um, there's certain modifications to Zen that are coming that I think will make the Zen more very attractive again. You know, it, uh, in an ideal world, we'd have an ab internal approach. Uh, that just did the job. I mean, that that has to be our goal, you know. But but we're not quite there yet. It's it's too um, dependent on a very small tube not blocking with tenons, um, and the mm -hmm. mitomycin staying more posteriorly. Whereas if you open up, if you open up and do ab external, there's probably not much to choose between the Zen and in focus. You could do either, and they'd be sim probably of similar. Um, levels of satisfaction. Yeah, because in the Zen, you have like different models, right? Like 140, 63, and 45. I saw I, that the 140 yeah. have less restriction in the resistance, right? I, I never used the, the 140. The 60, the, the, the in focus is 70 microns in diameter internally and eight millimeters long. And we know that that seems to give about the right level of resistance. Though having said that, in focus is hydrophobic, so that probably creates a little bit of resistance too. The Zen is hydrophilic, so it, it, not so much. Uh, and the 45 certainly is compatible with excellent pressures. What we don't know with a 45 is how much of that is due to any kind of persistent peritubular flow. The 63 I used to start with, and it was somewhere in between. And I wasn't very satisfied with the 63 originally, but again, that's because it had a lot of peritubular flow. What the company are now designing, uh, I believe, is an injector similar to the current one, but that will fit a 63. So in other words, all the flow will be through the Zen and not around the side of it. And I think that offers great potential because um, 63, we know from the in-focus, is not an excessive uh, dimension. So it shouldn't cause hypotony. 
if there's no peritubular flow, if only the aqueous is draining through the through the actual uh, tube itself. Mm. Perfect, perfect. Um, in, have you ever used ologen to put in your bleb? No, I've never. Um, I know it's popular in some places. There's no, there, it's sadly lacking <laughs> efficacy data. That that's the problem, you know. And the efficacy data that I have seen is not very promising. The um, the great thing about the modern devices, and I, I suppose it's largely with the FDA that we have to thank, is randomized trials. You know, we've got no matter what you think of the eye stent or the hydrus <clears throat> or the side pass, which is now no longer with us, we have randomized trials. So, so what you see, what you know, what what you see in the randomized trials should be what you get. With, with so many of these treatments that have come before, we just have opinion and retrospective studies and nothing comparative, and we just really don't don't know. And it's very very hard for these small companies to do randomized trials. But with the FDA forcing them to do F randomized trials, we're going to be in a much much better position to know what actually works and what doesn't, uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than chatting in webinars and deci <laughs> deciding for ourselves, which we do at the minute. It, it's all based on uh, people's perceptions. Uh huh. So uh, there's a doctor that concerns about uh, endothelial cell count. Uh, I I saw in your presentation that you talked about it, but uh, you don't have like any data about that, like uh, with these devices. With these devices, no. So there's no endothelial cell count data with Zen. There, there is the micro, the in-focus microshunt uh, uh, INN005 study, the, the FDA randomized clinical trial, they looked at prospectively at, uh, at endothelial cell counts. Um, and, and it's a, you know, it, it's obviously a concern. We don't know what the yes. data say yet. You know, I presented- have, the, have you looked- Have you looked like the, a normal tube or for you is something better in, in this case, that cell loss. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the, the I don't know what I, I presented the Barvelt data at the AGS this year. Um, I, I can I can show you that briefly. Um, but yes, uh, sure. If you've got a if you um, if you get a Barvelt. Um, This was a this was a prospective five year study uh, done in my clinic of mm -hmm. uh, um, of uh, basically a barbell. So there was a lot of you know there's a lot of evidence out there that that tubes damage the cornea. Um, we know that that's not rocket science. Yes. Um, a lot of surgeons focus on where the tip of the tube is and how long the tube is. But for a very long time, I've wondered about the entry site. You know, if the tube's entering in the cornea, then it might be more damage. And you've heard me speaking in that. I have this theory that if the tube is not in the cornea, or if it's actually way back in the angle, close to the iris, then the, the endothelium should be okay. So we, so we did this five-year prospective study of, uh, of, pa of uh, patients under my care recruited between 2011 and 2013. And we excluded anybody with corneal disease. And all of it was done by one examiner. And uh, we, looked at, we looked at pressure, uh, medication, complications, uh, gonioscopy, flare, and anterior segment OCT, and specular microscopy. And all of the patients ha had a bar felt with five minutes of mitomycin. And all of them were occluded with a super mid suture. And all of them were patched with pericardium sclera or cornea or something, and that, that's the kind of technique I used to occlude them. Uh, we did gonioscopy before and after surgery to look at the amount of PAS. We looked at the position of the tube entry site and the angle, and we categorized the tube as to where it was in the angle. So tip one was all of the tube in the angle, way behind Schwalbe's line. Tip two, some, some of it anterior to Schwalbe's line, but less than a half. Tip three, most of it, but not all of it, in front of Schwalbe's line. And tip four was basically all of the tube entry sites in the cornea. 
So if you look at this uh, tube here, you know, you can see, um, although that looks very nicely positioned, it's actually all on the cornea. The, the swabus lines here somewhere in the angles here. Um, and we did all these measurements with OCT in every case over five years. And uh, we standardized everything um, and looked at anterior chamber depth, corneal thickness, <clears throat> and peripheral and central endothelial cell counts. The peripheral count was taken over the tube. And we looked at peripheral count, hex hexagonality, coefficient of variation. And the only thing, just uh, moving quickly on, uh, there were 77 el eligible um, 72 actually took part and 64 completed the study for one reason or another. So it's 64 tubes um, at five years. And uh, they with a few hypotenies, one hyphema, one diplopia, one pupillary membranectomy, one exposure, one needed a side pass and one at hypotony needing revision. And uh, the uh, were largely secondary glaucomas. You, a lot of uveitis, so because of my practice, there's a lot of uveitis. Half of them were uveitis, and then 40% POAG and the rest. So 60% secondary glaucomas, 40% primary glaucomas. And we looked at IOP, highest recorded IOP 38, mean at time of surgery 32 on three meds. And uh, you can see for the UVX, the highest recorded IOP was higher than, than, than for the others. Um, but uh, baseline was a slight difference in corneal thickness for the UVX, but there weren't any difference from the rest. And there, there was really um, no overall difference between these groups. But interestingly, at five years, you can see there was, that's a, a dramatic loss of, uh, of uh, central corneal endothelium. So, Overall, in this group, they've lost 37% of corneal endothelium centrally at five years and 50% peripherally over the tube. And, you know, some would say, well, you know, we all knew this happens. Not, none of them got corneal edema, I must say. And the, the rate of corneal edema, despite this, is fairly low. We don't get many. Um, coefficient of variation, hexagonality didn't seem to make any difference. But both uh, central corneal endothelial cell count and peripheral count were down, were the only significant factors that were down at, at five years. And this seemed to be related to the tube entry site position. And significantly, if, if the tube was straddling Schwalbe's line, it seemed to be worse than, even worse than if it was actually in the cornea. So the tube, if the tube was posterior to Schwalbe's line, uh, there was no sig significant risk. The tube was straddling Schwalbe's line. It was the worst risk. And if it was in the cornea, it actually was, was slightly less risk. And you can see that um, tip three, in other words, straddling Schwalbe's line, um, had more than 50% loss of uh, corneal endothelium at five years. Um, tip four uh, was actually not quite so bad, but, but still uh, like that. And that was pretty much the overall uh, pattern. So if your tube was in the end of, was behind Schwab's line completely, you lose about 25% of the endothelium at five years. But if it's straddling Schwalbe's line, you use about 50%. So, that, so that, that's, really the, that's really what we found. Now, these tubes are uh -huh. 600 microns in diameter. The in-focus is 200 and, I can't remember, 240, something like that. So much, much less plastic. And the Zen's smaller uh -huh. still. So assuming that the size of the tube is important, the amount of tube that's affecting the endothelium that's is important, huge. then I think probably in-focus is going to do a lot less damage than this is this much smaller. And I think probably the Zen's going to do a lot less damage. We just don't have the data to know. But the in-focus study will give us the data. Uh, the Zen study, there, well, there is no Zen study looking at it. Um, so we don't have that information with Zen. But if, if it's much better than this with in-focus, then it's going to be better with Zen for sure. Interesting, yeah. 
And that, that's pretty much the bottom line that, you know, if, if you put your tube right in the angle, you're going to do less harm to the cornea, but you still do a little bit of harm. Lucho, ¿estás pues, por ahí? Sí. ¿Quieres, pre ¿Quieres preguntar algo? Sí, por favor. Okay. Hi, this is Luis, Juan Carlos' brother. Hi, Luis. smart guy who do cornea. You're the corneal guy, I remember. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yo, hey, thank you so much for your lecture. And, and this uh, work is really, really interesting. Um, there is some paper, I don't know, maybe four years ago, uh, during Arbo, what I saw was percent, like 80% of endothelial cell loss by year, okay? What, but what, what percent? 18, 18% for year. Luis, yes. it's highly variable what's published. There's, there's other ones saying only 5% loss, you know, so it's highly variable. Um, yeah, yeah, but what, what the paper so in this uh, on this case what they measure was not a position that is really nice of this uh yeah, work they, that you show this us this is why we, this is why we did this nobody's looked at position and exactly. I, for an awful long time i thought positions got to be important so what they measure was like the proteins okay and yeah. they think like it's uh, related with a uh, with, with with a chronic inflammation okay so my question is this um I don't know, it, it, this valve, that Belber valve, okay, yeah. it's, a, it's not a closed system, right? It's open yeah. system, right? Yeah. Oh, so my I question is out, this. I must point out, we, we looked at flare, you know, all of these patients okay. had flare measurements, and there was no correlation with flare and endothelial cell loss. Okay, okay. Do you know that maybe if we think something like proteins or inflammation, whatever, um, the, the Belver or the Amet valve can have a difference because the system that is open of valve? We don't know. Um, you know, when you remove the ripcord suture, you get some inflammation afterwards sometimes. And okay. uh, we, we don't know what the reason for that. But what we, we did find in this that flare was not associated with the endothelial cell loss. It didn't seem to matter. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It, it back at, it's, I've got it somewhere in the graphs. I can't remember which table it was in. But uh, it, it, because for years people have, um, and because we had so many uveitics, we thought that that might be a factor. Uh -huh. it, it turned out not to be one. Uh, where's flare? So you see, you can see here um, in this table, flare uh -huh. is obviously yeah. much uh -huh. higher in the uveitics than it is in POAG. It was quite and it's dramatic. Um, so there was a dramatic difference in flare, for sure, in this group. It was with a group of inflamed eyes and a group of uninflamed eyes. There's no difference in the endothelial cell counts. It didn't make any difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and another question. Now, at Murfield's, okay, what is the approach in page? Sorry, I missed the end, Luis. Corner transplant and glaucoma. I mean, what is the best surgical approach what you're doing now for glaucoma for these yeah. patients? This is funny, you know, I, I always was fairly surgically aggressive, but um, about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, people like Bruce Allen and the other corneal surgeons started referring me patients, saying, we want to do a graft here, please put in a tube first. And, uh, you know, I, I, these would be people who were controlled on glaucoma medication already, and they say, well, we, you know, if we do a graft, the glaucoma will be out of control, and then you'll need to do a tube, and then the graft will fail. So do it first, get them off the medication, get the pressure well controlled, and then we'll do the graft. And that's pretty much the policy now. And um, okay. our feeling in general is that TRABs are too unreliable. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, sometimes they suddenly stop working. And tubes are, despite all the problems with the cornea and tubes, tubes are more reliable. Uh -huh. and we tend to put in the tube, and so we tend to put in the tube and then do the de desec. I mean, it's desecs now rather than PKs, but uh -huh. we tend to do the tube and put, do the desec later. We've um, okay. the one the one thing I would say about this study, Luis, that we yeah. failed in is we didn't have any um, sulcus tubes. We there were only about one or two sulcus tubes that were eligible, and that was a big mistake because sulcus fixation might give us the answer if there was no 
endothelial cell loss from sulcus fixation, then you knew, you would know that it's definitely mechanical. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Gracias, Lucho. Okay. We have we have other question here. Is uh, if you have like a persistent hypotony after the infocus, how is your manage? I haven't had one. Ah. <laughs> and uh, in, no, in saying you, also, you, when a surgeon when a surgeon stands up and says that, you know he's got to be bullshitting. But I haven't had one. We had. Uh, I, I know that Soledad, my research fellow, is listening at the minute. I think and she, she's going to say, "Hey!" hey, hey. But um, we <laughs> did have. We did. We. We our retina surgeons are doing uh, some gene therapy studies, and sometimes these patients get severe inflammation afterwards after the gene therapy for retina, and end up with high pressures. And we've been doing. And trab Zen's in focus. And we did have one recently, a young guy. We did it in focus on, and he got hypotony afterwards. I mean, quite bad, but it actually recovered. Uh, it took a couple of weeks, but he that, that was the first one that I would say that really had serious hypotony. I'd have, um, I think, done about 160, something like that. Ah, a very good number. You do get, you do get hypotony. Now, it's I mean, I'm talking about hypotony, you need to do anything. I've certainly had patients with pressures of four or five in the first week, but deep chambers, no maculopathy, not needed to intervene, no viscoelastic injections, nothing. This young guy was the first one that we actually had to intervene. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at, at this moment, uh, these shunt devices replace your traps or are you still doing traps? If I get a patient with... Um, end of world glaucoma, you know, the advanced visual field loss or mm -hmm. serious central fixation threatening visual field defect, I still do a TRAB. If I've got a patient mm -hmm. where you can't afford to get it wrong, where you must get them under control with a first shot, then I still do a TRAB. TRAB still gives you the best bang for your buck in someone who really needs pressure control. Mm -hmm. And the in focus, you know, they, they did release the data and they did release the one year data from the in focus trial. And it showed that the mean pressures with TRABS, the mean success rate at one year in that study with TRABS was 100%, and with in focus was 93%, something like that. Uh, and the, uh, and the trap, if I recall, the mean pressures at one year with TRABS were, were 11 point something. And the main pressure within focus was about 14. So the, the company were very disappointed, but in fact, I thought they did very well. The Infocus was getting a good 30% pressure reduction. It just wasn't as good as a, a trab. And I think that's the thing. There are plenty of people who don't have glaucoma so bad that they need a trab. Infocus is perfect, or Zen's perfect. Mm, nice. So what else? Let me see. You have a lot of questions. Yeah, <laughs> but we like respond uh, during the, your session a lot of questions. So I have like we talk about the theology. And, uh, uh, Dr. Keith, well, I, they, want, I have one question. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Um, during during your imp the, during sen implant in the OR, have you ever like check and there's no fluid coming through? Have you ever changed, like take out the sen and do something else? Yeah, well, I, I occasionally I've taken out the sen and put in another one. You know, I, it, either it, it I couldn't get it positioned right. You you can take it out, reload it, and inject it again. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the trick to this is if you take it out and reload it, it they're often very sticky because of the helon, mm -hmm. and then they don't inject properly. So if you take it out and reload it, you've got to wash it, uh, get the, the heel on off it. Um, but you can take it out using vitrectomy forceps or using the bimanual. You can suck it out using the bimanual, um, as long as you don't suck it up it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take it out, reload it, and put it back in again. OK. So I see it's, it's a really long learning curve, maybe, for the sending plan. No, I mean, I've, I've painted, you know, 
uh, I'm not, not a very commercial picture of this because mm -hmm. uh, from a lot of cases, um, basically if you're a glaucoma surgeon and you, you know, and you're not scared of blood mm -hmm. and you're not scared of suturing, you'll be fine with Zens. If you just want to do eye stents and SLT, forget Zen. You know, it's really <laughs> not, you know, it's really not the sort of thing you're going to be doing. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. But, but you can say if you are millennial, like you said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what? You know, my, you know, my colleague called F. Singh uh, does this great talk on millennial glaucoma surgery, Migs. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I hope he, uh, she can participate also if if she are able. Okay. So, so I think and there's other question. If you are uh, doing the uh, Gil Carrasco, uh, Dr. Gil Carrasco from Mexico uh, mm -hmm. insertion technique, because uh, in all Latin America, when we're putting like a drainage device, we use mm -hmm. that technique, that tunnel. So oh, are you doing yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't use the tunnel. I, I've been using uh, Patchcraft. Um, tunnel techniques are getting more popular. Um, mm -hmm. In the end up, I, I'd like, uh, I'd, I'd be interested to see some, some uh, comparative data. The, the trouble with erosions is they come sporadically and can happen years later. And uh, I, th I just feel the patch graft is, a, is an easy way of reducing the, the risk of erosion. But uh, I, I've never actually done the, uh, the long tunnel technique, but I have a lot of colleagues who like it. So it, it seems to be good. Mm -hmm. And the last question is, are you using like a mitomycin in bare belt surgery? Yeah, yeah, we've, um, We've been using metamycin with bar belts since we started doing it. We, you, we use a lot. A lot. Now the, <clears throat> there's no data that says that metamycin is effective with bar belts. But on the other hand, uh, there's no downside. It doesn't cause erosions. It doesn't cause vascular blebs. We're putting it at the equator way back and they use a large dose. I used a 10 used 0.5 milligrams per mil. Uh, using 0.7 or 0.8 mils of mitomycin on two big, uh, on two wax, uh, wax cell sponges. My colleague Peng Kao uses one milligram per mil very often. So if you start using mitomycin at those levels, I think you, you will get an effect. It's just there's, uh, the studies that have been done haven't shown any effect, but then again, I'm not sure how the technique compares. Certainly, mm -hmm. If you use high doses of mito, you can get early hypotony if you don't get the flow control right. Um, so it certainly does, it certainly has an effect early on. We just don't know what the long-term effect is. But anecdotally, uh, we have found that we've used it, not used it, that we got better pressures when we used it. Mm. So are you doing like in special cases or in all your cases? Um, there are special cases when I don't use mitomycin. Um, that some of the some of the bad uveitics um, neovasculars where I think they might get hypotony, then I don't use metamycin. But mm. most of the other cases, I use metamycin in everybody. Perfect, perfect. I think we solved all the questions. Uh, we were like very dynamic in your presentation with the questions. So I think we are we are very good. Um, so we have a, so we have a good we have a nice dinner in Lima tonight. <laughs> I hope I hope we can have a a lunch or a dinner soon here in Lima. Keith. Yeah, well, you, you, uh, you, you do it. I, I could do a tour of the most famous restaurants in the world without ever leaving Lima. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we, we can make it soon. Uh, Keith, thank thank you very much for your participation in these webinars. Um, I'm sure everyone is uh, very happy at home. And I want to thank you again for your participation. And as sooner come soon. <laughs> as, always, as soon always, a pleasure, Juan Carlos. always a pleasure, Carlos. Always a pleasure. Pueden abrir sus micrófonos para darle un aplauso al Dr. Keith.
Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you. You too. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Para recordarles a todos que el día de mañana tenemos al doctor Fabián Lerner, pero la cita es a las 9 de la mañana. 9 de la mañana, horario Lima. Ahí está la ficha para que tengan los demás eh, horarios. Es sí, un poco más temprano. Uh -huh. Ajá, 9 de la mañana. Entonces nos encontramos a las 9, eh, un poquito antes de repente, para hablar con el doctor, ¿no, Mirel? Sí. sí. Y empezaríamos entonces a las 9 y 5. Eh, 9 y 5, sí. <risa> Perfecto. Y bueno, síganos Perfecto. en nuestras Perfecto. redes sociales, ahí se están colgando todas las charlas. Y si quieren tomar el screenshot o también está en Facebook el programa hasta ahorita, eh, el programa para esta semana. Súper, excelente. Ahí estamos. <risa> gracias, doctor. Buen día a todos. <risa> no, muchas gracias, Miren. Gracias a todos por participar. Un abrazo a todos en sus casas. Gracias. Hasta luego. Hasta luego, hasta luego.